My name is Edward Giraudet, and um, I'm a journalist and a writer, and I've been reporting, unfortunately, humanitarian crises and wars for well over 30 years. Sri Lanka, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and Afghanistan. And what I want to look at is basically how Afghanistan was really, perhaps, uh, the last major conflict the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, whereby journalists could still have the luxury of reporting a, raw, a war properly. Because since then, to my mind, over the past 20 years or so, the quality of global reporting has deteriorated dismally. And I believe that we now need to get back, uh, if we're going to serve society, have transparency, is get back to real reporting. Uh, the Soviet war itself began in December 1979, when the Soviets invaded the Red Army, and well over 1,000 journalists congregated on Afghanistan from all over the world. These journalists remained more or less for three, four, five months, but by June 1980, six months after the invasion, most had gone. And over the next decade, uh, or nearly decade, no more than 20 journalists Photographers, cameramen were reporting at any one time inside Afghanistan. Uh, you had others reporting out of Peshawar, but the quality of reporting had more or less dropped from the outside, which was extraordinary given that you had one of the world's two major superpowers involved in a war. Now, for me, this was my first war. I'd gone there, I had no, knew nothing about it, I went out to Kabul. Uh, and then began to report the war during the 80s, during the 1990s, and up to the present time. And in fact, the, what I tried to do with my book, Killing the Cranes, was more or less give a sense of what Afghanistan was and what Afghanistan is today, and why you need to pay attention to the past in order to report it properly. Afghanistan was an extraordinary, and still is an extraordinary country, which had a mix of 19th and 20th centuries. You had the Red Army on the one hand, uh, with its helicopter gunships, its MiGs, and then you had the Afghans reporting, uh, the Afghans fighting a war using 19th century tactics, 19th century weapons. For the journalists, it was also a foot war. We had to walk into Afghanistan. We would disappear for three, four, six weeks at a time. My editors never knew where I was or when I would get back. But what this did, it enabled you to really see the war closely. Unlike today, we did not have internet. Satellite mobile telephones were just coming into being. And this meant that you could go in and film, you could go and report, but you could only file your images, your stories, once you got out of the country. But it en enabled you to meet refugees. I mean, every day you walked 14, 16 hours. You met refugees, you met fighters. Uh, you saw the devastation of war. We always forget that war itself is not necessarily just the so-called bang-bang. It's the actual impact of war on civilian populations. And above all, Afghanistan is an extraordinary country. Uh, beautiful with deserts, the Hindu Kush, uh, an extraordinary terrain. And for me as a young journalist, I, I really felt, you know, I was in this amazing setting. I felt like Lawrence of Arabia. I felt like Hemingway covering the Spanish Civil War. And it was an extraordinary experience and also a privilege because we had the opportunity to go in. The problem for the TV networks, particularly in the United States, was that they wanted Vietnam again. They wanted the same sort of imagery that journalists were able to produce from Vietnam, the Bang Bang. But the problem with Afghanistan was that the Bang Bang did not come e easily. It was a very hard war to cover, particularly for the photographers and the filmmakers. People would disappear inside Afghanistan, even for months on end, looking for the sort of footage that the TV networks wanted. They wanted attacks, they wanted MiGs you know, flying through the air. And this also prompted a couple of journalists uh, to falsify footage, which group organizations such as CBS broadcast knowing that the footage was bogus. And to me, this was and still is an extraordinary insult to all the journalists who've been killed covering Afghanistan or covering other issues, such as Roy Peck, who was killed sadly in 1993 in Moscow, and Tim Hetherington, who was recently killed, a photographer and filmmaker who has also worked in Afghanistan, who sadly died in Libya. Uh, it was easier for writers such as myself, 
I mean, we could go in. Uh, I didn't have to go to the front line. We walked in, and we could spend hours and hours every day reporting what we saw, gathering this testimony. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, that's Ahmed Shah Massoud in the center, who a major commander in Afghanistan, who I first met in 1981, and also went up to see him uh, in September 2001 in Hojabawadin in northern Afghanistan in order to really go over and find out what he thought had happened over the past 25 years or so in Afghanistan or the time he was fighting. There were two men in the room next to me uh, posing as journalists, Arabs, and I had to go early because it was my wife's birthday on September 13th. Uh, Apologies. September 13th, and I had promised that I would go back to Geneva to see her. And I said I could face her, uh, the Taliban, but I could, certainly could not face her if I didn't come back. But that really saved my life. And uh, I got back to Pakistan, and on the morning of September 10th, I turned on the BBC to learn that Massoud had been either killed or se severely wounded by two Arabs posing as journalists. In fact, they were the two suicide bombers of Al Qaeda. Um, I also had the opportunity to meet fighters the whole time. You talked with them. I made a point of seeing different fighters from different organizations, different tribal groups, diff different ethnic groups, to try and get an overall picture. Uh, I also traveled with the French doctors. Very useful for a journalist, because as a man, I obviously could not see the female side of Afghanistan. 70% of the French doctors who were working clandestinely in Afghanistan for up to one year at a time, they worked with the local population, and I tried to travel with them as much as possible. Uh, also, you had to arrive in villages. You ate with the people. You talked with them. At night, they'd say, you know, we will answer your questions. But then, after you'd spent two hours totally exhausted, having walked 16 hours that day, you had to answer their questions. They all listened to the BBC, they all listened to VOA, and they were quite aware of what was happening around the world, but they wanted to hear what you had to say. I also got to meet warlords, uh, war criminals, such as Gulbuddin Hekmatia, who was uh, supported by the US during the Soviet war, and is now one of the leading insurgents against the US in Afghanistan, a monster we helped create. I came across a very tall Arab at the end of the Soviet war, who turned out, later turned out to be Osama bin Laden. We had a very long chat. You can read the book. I haven't got time to go into it, but uh, <laughs> it was a rather um, uh, curious encounter. Of course, I only learned years later who he was. Everything changed with the Gulf War, then the Balkans, leading up to the Afghan war, to the second Gulf War, when the media uh, suddenly became, particularly TV, became more concerned by technology than content. And this, I think, was a major contribution and has been a major contribution toward the diminishing of the quality of reporting worldwide. Also, quite a few journalists, particularly those parachuted in, which means from Washington, from London, from Berlin, they would embed with the military, which I think is actually a very bad idea. I think uh, during the Vietnam War, journalists could actually travel around with the military, but they were on their own. They could come and go as they pleased. Now the military tries to control you, and this causes a sort of a one-sided war, a one-sided approach. Also of growing concern, too, are the number of journalists who sort of identify with the military, which I think is also falsifies the picture in the long run. Another problem is the dictatorship of lifetime reporting. Journalists arriving on the scene, having to report within 20 minutes, and really having no idea what they're reporting about. That, I think, is a major concern. Also, you have the propaganda channels, such as uh, Fox TV, a gross insult to reporting, but, but posing and presenting itself as real journalism, which it certainly is not. Another problem, too, is that uh, the, the major media, the newspapers, all sort of cut back on their reporting worldwide, and this is really a serious problem. Almost all the major newspapers, major TVs, no longer have full-time correspondents based in different countries in order to do the reporting that you need on the ground and to put things into context. Uh, the parachuting does not help. And one example where I think the media dropped its responsibility, including the New York Times, including the Washington Post and others, was that post 9-11, the reporting dropped in the sense that no one was really criti being critical of what the Bush administration or of what Tony Blair's administration were doing, we started a completely unnecessary war in Afghanistan because there was a sort of McCarthyite 
mood atmosphere whereby journalists were treading carefully. The publishers did not want too critical reporting because they were fearful of being criticized as being non-patriotic. And this continues today in many ways. Uh, for example, failing to put Afghanistan to con in, into context, Haqqani was a great commander during the 1980s. He founded the Haqqani Network. His son is now running it and is one of the leading insurgent groups supported by Pakistan in Afghanistan. The confusion of journalists um, with infotainment posing as, as humanitarians. Either you're a reporter or you're a humanitarian. You cannot be both. And quite frankly, I think it's disgraceful that journalists use infotainment as a means of putting across humanitarian issues. Another problem is that some issues are, co uh, are covered well because all the journalists go in. Libya is an example. But what about those issues which need to be covered on a full-time basis or consistently? That's no longer happening. A lot of young journalists, volunteers or Freelancers simply are no longer able to go to Ouagadougou or Timbuktu and do the reporting they used to be able to do because there were media willing to commission them. Uh, one issue, for example, is this mixing of military and mercenaries, which pollutes the humanitarian approach and actually led, I believe, to the death of 10 humanitarians in the summer of, of 2010, several of whom in Afghanistan were extremely experienced and yet were lined up against the wall and executed because the insurgents did not make any more difference between who was a military, who was a humanitarian. Today, of course, everything's changed. We have new media, the power tools of today. And there's also a sort of obsession and mesmerization with social media in that we think it's now the answer and end all to, to, to everything. But the fact is that YouTube, Flickr, and so on, all they really are is a broadening of the platform, a broadening of the coffee table, of the coffee shop, whereby you can discuss, you can act as a witness, but is it really reporting? Is it really quality reporting? Uh, we also have, you know, numerous individuals doing witnessing events such as Egypt, such as Libya, such as Syria, very useful, but is it actually reporting and is it giving us a sense of context? You have the citizen journalism, which everyone likes to talk about. The problem is journalists, no matter who they are, still need to live, need to survive, they have families to feed, and are these citizen journalists credible? What happens when they get into the pocket of someone, a politician or a businessman or someone else? You still need reporting. I very quickly want to give three possible uh, you know, proposals for how we can improve the quality of journalism. One, I think that journalists worldwide, whether Western, whether from the third world, whether from emerging economies, whatever you want to call them, need to be better acquainted with what is a humanitarian response, what is a conflict, what is the impact of war. And I think we need better training, all of us, uh, of this issue. Uh, another is that we need to also I think create a fund for humanitarian crises and conflicts whereby uh, this could be run by a major foundation perhaps, whereby you can give small grants, maybe $1,500 to enable a journalist to go out and buy a uh, ticket to go and cover something, or $100,000 for someone who wants to do an investigative report, a documentary, into an issue. And by the way, I think also the humanitarian situations worldwide need better reporting because, as we all know, a lot of the aid agencies involved, some of them shouldn't be there, some of them are there primarily for fundraising purposes. I think we need to have qualified local and international journalists who can actually cover these issues properly and in the long term, which is not happening. And finally, you know, I see my own kids. I have an 11-year-old and an 18-year-old, and I am very concerned about the future. I am concerned by what sort of information will they have, how can they discern what is real, what is not, how can they read the internet, Will they be reading newspapers? It, and it, you know, it doesn't matter what's going to happen. I mean, everyone is looking for the new model of tomorrow for a newspaper, for a news organization. I think schools need to get together with media, whether they are newspapers, TVs, uh, radio stations, it doesn't matter, and sit down and acquaint them with what is information, how, how do we know it's credible, and how can we get back to real reporting? Uh, finally, I think it really is in the public interest worldwide, this is us here, people in Africa, Asia, to have proper investigative journalism, because I think that is the most effective and possibly the only effective tool for real public accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you.